I'm delighted to be here at the Crossways Festival. I'm Paula Meehan and I'm here live in my own living room here in Baldoyle on the north side of Dublin. Coastal, maritime, estuarial type of landscape out there and it's a really, really bitter winter's day. So great to be here. I'm going to start with a poem uh, called Well, because poetry has been a great source and resource to me throughout my life. So, Well. I know this path by magic, not by sight. Behind me on the hillside, the cottage light is like a star that's gone astray. The moon is waning fast, each blade of grass a rune inscribed by hoarfrost. This path's well worn. I lug a bucket by bramble and blossoming blackthorn. I know this path by magic, not by sight. Next morning when I come home quite unkempt, I cannot tell what happened at the well. You spurn my explanation of a sex spell cast by the spirit who guards the source that boils deep in the belly of the earth. Even when I show you what lies strewn in my bucket, a golden waning moon, seven silver stars, our own porch light, and your face at the window staring into the dark. So that's well. Um, I first had an idea of myself as a poet, as opposed to someone who wrote poetry, when I spent time up in the Shetland Islands, up in the middle, uh, the middle of the 70s. And there, for the first time, I began to uh, read myself with an idea that someone else would read these words. Uh, so it was a, a very important stay up there. And though I went to the Shetland Islands as someone who wrote poetry, I came back as a poet. So home, this is a rambling poem, a kind of a come all ya. And I got it on tour up in the north of Ireland with a bunch of traditional musicians uh, just before the first ceasefire in 1994. So it was a time of terrible sectarian violence, but we were traveling around together, bringing poetry and the tunes into all different kinds of venues. So I got this poem from that trip. Home. I am the blind woman finding her way home by a map of tune. When the song that is in me is the song I hear from the world, I'll be home. It's not written down and I don't remember the words, but I know when I hear it, I'll have made it myself. I'll be home. A version I heard once in Leitrim was close, a wet Tuesday night in the Shanrelig bar. I had come for the session. I stayed for the vision and lore. The landlord called time. The music dried up. The grace notes were pitched to the dark. When the jukebox blared out, I'd only four senses and he left me senseless. I'd no choice but to take to the road. On Grafton Street in November, I heard a mighty sound. A travelling man with a didgeridoo blew me clear to Botany Bay. The tune too far back to live in, but scribed on my bones in a past life. I must have been kangaroo, rocked in my dream time, convict ships coming o'er the foam. In the puzzle factory, one winter, I was sure I was home. The talking in tongues, the riddles, the rhymes struck a chord that cut through the pharmaceutical haze. My rhythm, catatonic, I lulled myself back to the womb, my mother's heart beating, the drum of herself and her world. I was tricked by her undersong, just close enough to my own. I took then to dancing, I spun like a dervish. I swear, I heard the subtle music of the spheres. It's no place to live but out there in space on your own hung aloft the night. The tune was in truth a mechanical drone. I was a pitiful monkey jigging on cue. I came back to earth with a land 
to rain on my face, to sun in my hair, and grateful too. The wise women say you must live in your skin, call it home. No matter how battered or broken, misused by the world, you can heal. This morning a letter arrived on the nine o'clock post, the Department of Historical Reparation, and who did I blame? The nuns, your mother, the state. Tick box provided, we'll consider your case. I'm burning my soapbox. I'm taking the very next train, a citizen of nowhere, nothing to my name. I'm on my last journey. Though my lines are all wonky, they spell me a map that makes sense. Where the song that is in me is the song I hear from the world. I'll set down my burden and sleep the spot that I lie on, at last the place I'll call home. So, moving along, um, I, I thought I'd read this uh, little prose poem. Uh, it's called Folktale, and I've heard versions of it really all over the world. Um, you know, the version of the changing uh, female, the triple uh, moon creature who can look like a spare van at one moment and the hag at the next. And she, she flits in and out of Irish poetry, especially in the Ashling tradition. And she was kind of elected then to be uh, a symbol of the nation, the, the Shan Van Vucht, the old, the poor old woman roaming the ro roads, uh, lamenting her lost four green fields. Anyway, this is my version of her. Uh, I elect her, I suppose, as a symbol of truth. Folk tale. A young man falls in love with truth and searches the wide world for her. He finds her in a small house in a clearing in a forest. She is old and stooped. He swears himself to her service to chop wood, to carry water, to collect the root, the stem, the leaf, the flowering top, the seed of each plant she needs for her work. Years go by. One day the young man wakes up longing for a child. He goes to the old woman and asks to be released from his oath so that he may return to the world. Certainly, she says, but on one condition, you must tell them that I am young and that I am beautiful. So, uh, this, this next poem is an elegy for a pal, for a friend of mine who is a great um, builder of connectivity between this island, especially her native zone uh, of Wexford, and the island uh, of, of Lewis. Um, just a marvellous artist, a fabric artist, uh, who researched and initiated projects in the weaving uh, tradition. So that was one of her many draws up to Stornoway and up to the mills up there, the weaving mills and the weaving uh, at the crofts. So this is an elegy for her. She died far too young, beautiful soul, beautiful woman. So it's in memory, Joanne Breen. And I read this for my pal, Malcolm McLean, up there on the Isle of Lewis. I am fingering a length of yarn from the mill at Stornoway. It is green as a summer meadow, though when I untwine it with her shins, I see, spun into the yarn, fibres of blue and yellow and purple, occasionally orange. I am undoing the magic of the spindle, unravelling. The day we buried her, gorse was a golden flame. We buried the summer with her. We buried high clouds of May, the swallows we buried, those stitchers of land to sea, those grafters of sky to the dark earth which opened to her beauty. 
We buried the song of her body and all it promised of betrothal and children and work. The way she would weave dolphin and salmon and swan in a tapestry out of the land itself. Its very warp and woof, its stuff, its dye, its fixings, the land she trod so lightly on. I am fingering a length of yarn from the mill at Stornaway. Deep winter now and the wind crying in the chimney. The candle gutters in a draught. The shadow sways on the wall. And breath, breath snags on memory. Once upon a springtime, she is a girl in the branches of an old beech in the back field. She holds fast to the rope and out she jumps. The dog, the clouds, the hedgerows, the rooftop, the hay barn, the cows, the stream, the starlings, the byre, the bees, the hill, the village, all spun together. Dizzy and giddy, she laughs, swinging out into the arms of our love. So, so I'm going to move on and read um, a series of short poems. And they come from my last published collection, uh, which is uh, what is called geomantic, which is a word which hovers around the meaning of divination by the marks made on the earth, uh, the patterns on the earth itself, or sometimes uh, handfuls of earth thrown down that are read uh, in a divinatory way, though in fact, um, I don't think it's about foretelling the future so much as seeing which way the wind is blowing. So this was uh, one long poem of 81 parts, but I wanted each part to have a, an existence on its own. Um, a bit like Patchwork Quilt, which was one of the main inspirations for it, especially those quilts the communities make here in Dublin, but all over to commemorate their children lost to, uh, to drug use, um, which is a huge issue for the communities of the inner city where I come from and the communities I still work with. So, uh, so, that, so I'm going to read these and they were made to be read in any order. Uh, so, and each one is, it was one of those manic patterning um, adventures. So each one is nine, each patch is nine lines long. Each line has nine syllables and the whole thing adds up to uh, 81. And I do see it as a quilt, a kind of memorial quilt. And this, this poem opens with a phrase, leave her in the lap of Our Lady, which was something I would have heard all my childhood for those things that you can't change or cure or help at the moment. So the trust. Leave her in the lap of Our Lady, her counsel for where to place the lost when we close the door on their madness. She slammed the door on her own daughter, left her to the city's chartered streets, found her in the Liffey's dark water, cast up in the week before Christmas, the city gripped in the hardest frost, the eve of the new austerity. So the clouds. Some mornings the room is full of clouds. Clouds where the students' heads ought be, little weather systems of their own. They put all their work up on the cloud, dream and song and secret and story. Consciousness seeds the digital zone with cold fronts, sunny spells, cirrus clouds. Every weather of the room I grieve, the cloud children of the new machines. The Pinhead. 
just how many angels were dancing last night in your junk dazed eyes? And how in God's name can you be such a drag on this miraculous entrancing creation? You swear you can change now with your life in a black plastic bag. We dread the sight of you, advancing feathers flying, thunder on your brow, frightening the children and the dog. The Broken Bow We held our breath when you were a boy out on a limb of the old oak tree, helpless below as you shimmied up into its shadowy canopy. That day the bow broke and you clung there alone through the sudden thunderstorm. We came upon you after unafraid though drenched to the bone. The pattern set. All those times since, we wasted our breath. The book from Belfast. This was a, a little book that, well, a big book, a big tome that uh, Kieran Carson sent down to me one time when I had a fever. And uh, it, this, this collection, Geomantic, is dedicated to Kieran Carson and Deirdre Shannon, his uh, wife, the, the, the traditional fiddler. Um, so, and it's, it's actually, there's a, there's a line of his, if I can find it. Um, yeah, there's a line of his which prefaces the, the sequence and it's indefatigable, dazzling, terrestrial strangeness. I just love that. Indefatigable, dazzling, terrestrial strangeness. And for sure, we're living through pretty strange times. So, moving on. So the flood. Now, there are parts of Ireland where probably I would be run out of town for this poem. Uh, you don't often get too many poems in praises of natural disasters. But there's something about the stillness after flooding. The flood. It was only when it receded we knew it for the gift it had been. If truth be told, we missed the water. It was exactly what we needed. We missed the way it made a mirror, doubled goose, godwit, egret, heron, and that once in moonlight, we looked down on two complete and drowning strangers, those depths where later Wolfbane seeded. And I wanted to read the wee poem for uh, the book from Belfast, uh, which I will now. The book from Belfast. That day I thought I'd never find peace or draw a sane breath this side of hell. The postman knocked with Berenson's tome, Italian painters of the Renaissance. I couldn't read. Typeface made me feel ill. When I closed my sore eyes, I would dream witch-sniffing burners from Aberdeen. So then, your gift, salvific, the grace of childhood, all halo, wing, animal. The Woodpile. This is a small poem for uh, our great novelist, John McGahern, who was one of my teachers back in the day. And uh, when I visited Madeline, his wife, after he died up in Leitrim, she showed me the, the barn and it was full of logs that he'd cut, knowing that he wouldn't be there long. But he left a few winters heat for her. The Woodpile. We worked our way through it log by log. Three winters worth of heat, precious light, 
through the darkest nights, the darkest days. You'd remarked you knew the very tree that last June you stacked them in the barn, the silver logs in their fret of moss. You must have had the news already whistling from the woodpile's finished height, your arms about your favoured black dog. And the little, uh, the little, another, I, I suppose I keep saying the little poems because they're all little, really. Um, this one, the ghost song, which is um, probably one of the newest literary forms invented by that magician, Terence Hayes, the golden shovel. And he invented this form, which has become quite popular, where you take a line of the great American poet, Gwendolyn Brooks, you take one line of hers and spin your poem out of the words in that line. So I, I think it's fantastic in, in the centuries of verse in English that this wonderful new form has come, which gives you great freedom. So the ghost song and the line from Gwendolyn Brooks I took was the singers and workers who never handled the air from her monumental poem, The Mother. From a dream of summer of absinthe, I woke to winter. Carol singers decked the walls of some long lost homeland. Late night choppers and drowsy workers headed for the train. So the night that you died was two-faced. June, light, never far from mind, though snow fell. I handled grief like molten sunshine, learned to breathe your high, lithe ghost song from thinnest air. So they all came out of this, which is just hot off the press this book, As If By Magic, which are poems selected from about 30 years of making poetry. Um, so I'm delighted it came out and it's miraculous, I believe, that it came out on time during a worldwide pandemic. The mind boggles. So I'm going to finish up with a poem called The Solace of Artemis. And Artemis, of course, was the great Greek goddess. Uh, and she was the protector of all things that gave suck, um, including the human creature. Um, but she is a fantastic emblem for these times, for the wild. And she has a connection. Her sanctuaries were always originally cave sites um, and over which the great big classical temples were later built. But she has a long association with bears going back to the Neolithic. So research, which was published in 2011 from Trinity College in Dublin, uh, from Oxford over in England and from Penn State University in the States. Uh, the researchers had sampled bare bones from 27 different sites, mostly cave sites uh, around Ireland, and they discovered the, with the genetic signature that every single polar bear alive today has mitochondrial DNA from one Irish brown bear. Not that there was such a, a place as Ireland then, but sure, we need all the help we can get. So we're claiming it uh, as our great achievement. So the solace of Artemis. I read that every polar bear alive today has mitochondrial DNA from a common mother an Irish brown bear who once roved out across the last ice age, and I am comforted. It has been a long, hot morning with the children of the machine, their talk of memory, of buying it, of buying it cheap. But I, memory keeper by trade, scan time coded in the golden hive mind of eternity. I burn my books, I burn my whole archive, a blaze that sears, synapses flaring cell to cell, where memory sleeps in the wax hexagonals of my doomed and melting comb. 
I see him loping towards me across the vast ice field to where I wait in the cave mouth, dreaming my cubs about the den, my honeyed ones smelling of snow and sweet oblivion. So thank you very much for your attention today and I wish you all the very, very best for the future. Thank you.